recording. No. It, today is November 9, 2009. This is Sierra Haskett here with Vietnam veteran John Foster. Um, I'm going to start with your like childhood. Okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Can you describe your parents? Uh, my mom and dad were both born and raised in Tennessee. Um, my dad was a World War II veteran. He was in the Navy, and when he got out of the service, uh, he and my mother married and moved to Muncie, Indiana, for just to pursue uh, employment. And I, I'm one of four children. I grew up in a very small home out in Cowan, Indiana. Had a great childhood. Uh, things weren't perfect, but I, I, I have very fond memories of my childhood. It's kind of neat going to a small school. Uh, believe it or not, I actually enjoyed going to school every, every day. wasn't the best student, but just had a great childhood, really. So, so where did you go to? Uh, Cowan High School. Okay. What kind of activities were you in? Um, I played athletics up until about the ninth grade, and then I just got involved. I was a, uh, an officer throughout my high school. Uh, played some golf. Uh, just got into the social thing as much as anything, so. Okay, now I'm gonna kind of go into the war. Mm -hmm. uh, when was the first time that you remember being aware of the war? You know, that's interesting. I, I, I've thought about that a lot. I had a lot of very close friends, and you know, we'd go out and hang out at the evening. We'd, when we'd come home, we'd sit in the car in front of one of one of or another's friends' homes, and. We used to just talk about anything and everything. I remember just analyzing the world problems. But the odd thing is, I, I really don't remember us talking about the Vietnam War a lot. And I know it, as aware as we were, we had to have been very aware of it. I just don't remember that being a large part of our conversation or ever wondering if any of us would end up going to Vietnam. But probably most of my memory was just from the, the evening news, you know, when you sit down and have dinner. Uh, you know, that was every night an anchor man was reporting from Vietnam, so. Yeah. I remember family conversations about it around the dinner table, or? Oh, I know, just some things. I know my my parents were very upset when uh, it was in Cassius Clay, who became known as Muhammad Ali, claimed to be a, a minister of some sort, and they were very upset about that. But that that's just one of the conversations I remember. But. I don't really recall us talking that much about it. So it was something. It, you got to the point you just you just lived with it. It was on every night, and you know by the time I was drafted, it it was toward the end of the war. So you just kind of tolerated it and went on with your life. I think so. So were you one of your friends that was drafted later? Or did you have any friends that were drafted before? You know, or? to my not, I only know of one other of my classmates. I, I was county school is kind of a small school, but there were about 56 of us that, you know, my class. And of 56, I, was, I know of only one other guy that went into the service, and I don't think he went to Vietnam. So I was the only one in my class that went. When did you um, become aware of the, well, when did when were you drafted? Do you remember that moment when you found out? Yes, it was interesting. I, for some, I just I had no aspirations to go on to college right out of high school. Uh, I did what a lot of people did. I started working in a factory, and a guy that graduated from Delta, we became good friends. And he just happened to come up to me one evening on break, and I I, I, I have very good memory. I mean, I have a very good memory, and I remember him asking me what my draft number was, and I kind of looked at him. I don't know, and he said, "Well, it was in this evening's paper." So. I took a break. We went, pulled out the newspaper, and basically it just assigned your birth date, and it gave you your lottery number. And mine was 19, and I think he was in his upper 20s. And we both kind of looked at each other and said, "We're going to Vietnam," <laughs> you know. So, so that was my first realization that I was probably going to be going into the service. So, how did you feel about that? I was a little unreal in some respects, but. Uh, other than I, I don't remember. It just, you know, wasn't like I was gonna go out and commit suicide. You know, it was, it was just I just, well, I'll get through this, I guess. So. Who was the first person you told other than? Catching Probably my parents when. How they react? Uh, the, bittersweet, I think. You know, because again, I I come from a long line of patriots. You know, very proud of that, and um, 
but I know my mom and dad, they were upset about it, but uh, but it was something we'll worry about that when, when the time comes. So. Um, basic training, where did you go? Went to Fort uh, Knox, Kentucky, which fairly close to, to home. And uh, nice thing about that, I, you know, my parents and family came down to visit a couple of times, and um, I think I did get to come home one time during basic training. But And from there, I went to... Um, Fort Polk, Louisiana. That was where I took my AIT advanced individual training. Uh, one of the things I remember about BASIC is toward the end of it, we were waiting, they were signing us our MOS, which basically explains what you're going to be doing during your, your time with the military. And any anything that started with an 11, that was a combat MOS. And uh, I was 11B10, which is combat infantry, lightweight infantryman. Once I got down to Fort Polk, Louisiana, they assigned me 11 C-10, which I was also, in addition to being an infantryman, I was trained on the mortar, so so that, and I'll, I'll never forget, we flew a, it was like a military charter from Fort Polk down to, uh, I'm sorry, from Fort Knox down to Fort Polk, and I remember when we came down out of the clouds, it looked like jungle down there, and it was hot, there was sand, and it, you kind of, felt like you were in Vietnam or whatever. It was very appropriate training though, so. Uh, what were the attitudes of the people around you in basic? I mean, about being... Well, an interesting thing about that, uh, probably about half of my company were National Guard. They were there just for their basic training and they knew they were going to be staying there for their AIT and then they would go home. And I learned a very, very, well, very quick lesson, I guess, because you're paired off in alphabetical order. And uh, my best friend was Louis Ferrero. He was from New Jersey, and he was National Guard. And you just become very tight with your your friends because everybody's kind of scared. And you you draw within, and the realization at the end of our basic that uh, I was probably going to end up going to Vietnam, and he was going to be going back home. That that kind of taught you an early lesson, and it kind of tempered your friendship a little bit. You know, you, you still had good friends, but you quickly realized nothing was, was very permanent in the military, so. And you would carry that all the way into mm -hmm. the Yeah. Well, some people say that that happened to most people. Would you say that? Uh, yeah, even, but when I got to Vietnam, there was a core group of us, though, that were, were very tight, though, you know. And, and it, interestingly enough, when, uh, when you went over, when you came back, when I went on R and R, everybody came into country about the same time. I ran into a couple of guys that had been stationed in other areas of South Vietnam. When we were going on R and R, we saw each other at the airport, and when you're coming home, so it was like we were all in the same cycle and everything. But uh, uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit about you know the first week of basic. Okay. I mean, I'm sure that was you know mind bending a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, did you find it difficult? Yeah, we. I remember we, had, we got up very early here in Muncie. We had to report down on South Walnut Street, and they bused us to Indianapolis and processed us in. Then we were on a, a bus and went down to, we were in Indy most of the day, and then uh, they bused us on down to Fort uh, Knox at night. So we got down, and see, this was, I think, February of 1970. So we got down there. During the night, it was a little bit of snow flurry. It was starting to get cold, and... Uh, I remember we're in this big room. The first time you met a drill sergeant, he's addressing everyone. And uh, one of the first things, he said, I know you you trainees are probably all hungry, so as soon as we get through here, we're going to take you over and introduce you to a military chow. And other guys that had already had been there ahead of they start laughing and everything. And it, it was almost like onion water or something, <laughs> you know, and some bread. But we were just in kind of a... Uh, uh, we were in a temporary quarters until they assigned us to a unit and everything. So they sent us over. We had to go get a, an old field jacket just to keep warm. And uh, I'll never forget, it was it was real cold. It was at night. And I've got my hands, my pot, and cold air is blowing my face. And some guy, it was dark, some guy screams at me, uh, trainee, don't you know any better than the, you're supposed to salute officers? And in retrospect, later on, I thought that this was probably some PFC or something, just jacking around with with a new recruit, you know. So, but it it would you, you know you had a sense of of fear, fear of the unknown. But but again, it, everybody starts drawing within because, and that's kind of the way the military, that's the way they they train you. They they kind of try to. 
I don't want to say demoralize you, but just mentally and physically wear you down and then you really turn within and then you build back up as a team then. So I think I just described the way Bobby Knight coached his basketball team. <laughs> uh -oh. What skills did you bring to basic that were useful? I know th this is probably going to sound very corny, but I was in Boy Scouts when I was in high school, and I, I still see my, my old scout master. He's, he's a retiree from Borg Warner, and we see each other on a regular basis, and I have told him over and over that the skills that I learned in scouting, it, it was just a no-brainer when I got to Vietnam, because you know, for 10 months you slept on the ground, you slept on your rucksack, and for some people, that, you know, that was a cultural shock just to start out with, just living in the elements, and for me, it, it was no big deal. You know, I just felt very at home. So, so that gave me a big edge, I think. And the other skill, I have my sense of humor. That a sense of humor will get you through anything. And uh, you said you attended other training. Uh, what did you mortar? Uh huh. Can you describe some of that? Yeah. First of all, Fort Hood was it was very hot and humid because I I got down there probably around oh April or May and uh, it was just hot humid sand you know marching in sand and everything but really they trained us on a variety of weapons and I, um, I just you know the main thing was was training us on the mortar but you still had to qualify on you know your M16 and. Colt 45 and things like that. So I just remember busing us out to ranges and back and and learning how to fire a variety of weapons and everything. So was, was there anything you were really good at that you didn't think you would be? Not really. I I grew up with guns and everything and uh, a pretty good shot and everything. You know. So uh, after training, what unit were you assigned to? Do you mean? When I went to Vietnam, or yeah. well, it was the uh, 198th Brigade, first of the Sixth Infantry, and it's in Bravo Company. So, and what was your MOS? I went over 11 C10. So, um, and you said you were part of the Ameri AmeriCal Division. Mm -hmm. um, did you already know about the connection it had with the no. No. no? Well, see, I, um, see, I don't. If memory serves, I think that had just played out just before I got over. I think it was exposed. You know, obviously it happened a couple of years prior to me going over there. But uh, you know, it's I don't care what you you know division you're assigned to. You, you're proud of it and everything. And it's just you know, it's just a shame that this one, this one incident it kind of branded our whole our whole unit and everything. So. Were you nervous about going to Vietnam? Yes, yeah, very. <laughs> Did your feelings uh, about the war change? You know, as you know, as you were training, once you got there. Well, the big thing, and I, I think this is it's just natural for anybody, but you know, you, you just you developed a very poor. Um, attitude toward the army you know it's it's government at its finest you know but but you know they their tasks they have to they have to train people with some people it's not very sharp and others that are very sharp you know so you have to find a common ground and so sometimes it's kind of boring to you because they you didn't know who they were trying to reach and they did a lot of things you just you didn't see the reasoning for it and everything but um I think they constantly just kept you in a state of flux, that, and I think that was by design because if you had too much time to think about things, and there, there, I came to the there's a reason that they drafted 19-year-olds because if you're in your late 20s, you probably wouldn't have done a lot of the stuff they they told you you had to do. <laughs> you know, it wasn't until the smoke cleared and you're out of the service and you look back, that, I probably didn't have to do that. You know, <laughs> so. Um, how did you get into the? Uh, flew over. We went from, uh, came home, had a 15 day leave, uh, flew from Indianapolis out to Fort, uh, well, Seattle Tacoma Airport out to Fort Lewis. Was there for maybe two or three days and then they just, they flew a, a big charter plane of uh, a bunch of GIs and we went through Anchorage, Alaska and then uh, I think it was Yokota Air Force Base in Japan just for refueling and then flew into Cameron Bay. 
and um, that was that was quite an experience. You, we, you really had no idea what to expect when you got. I mean, you, you didn't know is there going to be people shooting at you the minute you get off the plane. So, but it's um, I'll tell you, I've, I've told a lot of people if if you've ever seen the movie Platoon, th that was very close to my my experience of. I mean, the whole the way it was displayed. I mean, you can on the tarmac you can see heat rising up. You see. GIs is getting ready to come home. They've got, you know, kind of an orangeyness to their boots and everything, and they just look tired, you know. And and you're sitting here in your brand new green jungle fatigues, and new boots, and feeling very awkward and everything, and just kind of overwhelmed by everything. So, uh, where you said you landed in in Cameron Bay, mm -hmm. and how did you get to your final location? That's a it's a little hazy to me right now, but I just remember um, eventually you, you, you were in these kind of holding units where you're in transit until orders were cut as far as where you were actually going to end up. And from there I went to Chu Lai, and they call it the Combat Center, and that was kind of an indoctrination of what to expect in your area there. And we, we had a little bit of training, and they kind of exposed us to, well, they call it sapper training. Sappers were the, that was the Viet Cong that would come in at night under the, crawl under your wires and everything, and just try to probe your defenses and everything. And I never forget the whole time this guy's lecturing to us, and next thing all of a sudden this guy just pops out of nowhere and fires off a magazine of blanks, and he'd been crawling up to us this whole time, and we didn't even see him, you know. So that, that kind of put a little fear, <laughs> fear in you, you know. So. Um, can you describe that first night? That you were there. Yeah. Again, it you you're in temporary quarters, so it was just a uh, um, it was just a very bare. When I say a barracks, it was you know kind of open side with screens because it was so hot there, and just a couple of bare light bulbs and bunk beds with just springs. I I don't even think we had mattresses or anything. It was just a place to crash. So you know, it it was um, you know you felt very detached from. Your fan, but but again, the whole basic training and AIT, everything was so fast paced. They really didn't give you a lot of time to to think about missing things. So, you know, it was a lot of apprehension, a lot of anxiety. But I can't say that I was just scared to death. You know, it was just just waiting to see what was going to happen. <laughs> you know, so. But I knew I wasn't in Cowan, India. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> you know, so. Daily routine. Once you got into the routine of things, can you describe that? Well, I'll try to ex explain this. But after about every third or fourth mission, our immediate rear area was a fire base. That's where you would work in and out of. And a mission might last two weeks, three weeks, and between missions, you'd go back to the fire base. You could shower and clothes and things like that. And uh, and then after about every third or fourth mission, they called it stand down, where you'd actually go back to your company rear, and that was Chu Lai, and that was right on the South China Sea. Uh, if you didn't know there was a war on it, it kind of looked like a resort, you know, cause real blue water and everything. But uh, so when I was assigned to my my permanent unit, my unit was on stand down. So so I meet them, and and it's three days of just partying, you know, getting drunk at night, seeing floor shows during the day, and uh, Having access to the PX and and the uh, you know eating your food there at the mess hall and everything. From there, they then went to uh, pacificationville duty, and uh, I don't know if if you're familiar with that, but that was they were establishing safe villages, and they would constantly rotate units in and out of there, and you just pulled bunker guard duty at night and basically just kind of goofed off during the day. Occasionally you might run a patrol, but it was just a show of force to protect protect them from the Viet Cong, you know, the hostiles and everything. So I went from stand down to about two or three weeks of pacification duty, and other than pulling guard duty at night, I thought, you know, this hey, this isn't too bad, but from there then we went out on our first mission, and I remember we all flew out on a, it was a Chinook helicopter, that's one of the big double prop and the the back drops down and you know that 
you're taught when you dismount any helicopter, you, you go out and form a perimeter and, you know, with your weapons while they, they take off just to pull security. Well, again, kind of like Charlie Sheen, you, I've, I've got all, all my gear on you, my steel pot, got this full rucksack on, and I'm never forget running off the off the back of this helicopter and we all form a perimeter and I'm sitting here with my M16, my rucksack is pushing up on the back of my my steel helmet and it's pushing down on my eyes and I keep trying to push up and I remember thinking I'm gonna get killed out here. I won't even be able to see who does it or anything and you just totally overwhelmed. And you just knew there was Viet Cong behind every every bush, every tree out there. And fortunately there was nothing out you know, we didn't see anything at that point. But and then we just hooked up and uh, and they called it humping, where you know single file and keep a maintain a spacing, and we were headed out to some location, and uh, and I, I keep to, hate to keep referring to platoon, but in that early on, Charlie Sheen's humping along, and he just gets overcome by the heat, and he sits and he just about passes out, and I swear that that happened to me, and again, some of the older veterans, or they come out and they say, man, you don't need this or this, you know, and they're telling you send your steel pot back to the rear, and you. You got a bush hat, and you just started trammel as light as you could, you know. So, we even had a flak jacket on, and man, that thing weighed like ten pounds. And and again, it's it's probably ninety degrees out there. So, so we the green the new boots we we stood out, you know. But fortunately, they came up. They gave us a lot of good advice and everything. So, so did you like your superiors? Yeah, superior? liked everybody very well. There was a c couple of guys that. They were kind of like cowboys, you know. They were they were regular army. They were career soldiers, and and they put on a little show, you know. They they enjoyed that, but hey, they paid their dues, you know. It was it was like a pecking order, you know. The the longer seniority you had, you everybody looked up to them, you know. So, but everybody was very decent, though. They, Did you see any combat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, we were in a defensive role, and I, I was over there. One of the things that happened early on, I'd been there probably about three months, and uh, my platoons, or my squad, he, he was called, it was a shaken, they called him a shake and bake. He was probably about six weeks, maybe two months ahead of me, and he had gone through NCO training. So they go through this intense training, and they come out a, a buck sergeant. So he was only had only been in the service maybe a couple months ahead of me but he had the rank and it had some you know some training so he was our squad leader our platoon leader was further back down and I was kinda of up toward the front we had a, a new guy all I remember him by we called him Tex and he was walking point and we were coming by this village and uh, actually it was Sergeant Hamilton he was an E7, E6 I think he hollered up to pass the word on to find a place to take a break. And the rule of thumb, Viet Cong, where I was at was very heavily booby trapped and the Viet Cong knew that GIs were pretty lazy so instead of fences there were hedgerows over there defining rice paddies and there'd be a little break in between the hedgerow just like instead of a gate there's just an opening that you could walk through. Well they knew rather than a GI is going to be busting through down here they're going to take the path of least resistance so that's where they would booby trap things on you'd have dikes for that would help define the rice paddies well you you never walked on the dikes you'd walk through the muck through the mud because again if they're going to booby trap they think GIs are lazy and they'd put it on the dikes and everything so Tex finds a spot to go in and unfortunately Sergeant DeBakey who was my uh, the shake and bake he started moving in, you know, moving in a little closer to Tex, and Tex stepped on a booby trap and ended up knocking both of them out. And we had to call a medevac helicopter out. They medevac both of them off, and Sergeant Hamilton needed a squad leader, so he said, "Foster, you're my squad leader now." So, so I got, as a result of that, I, I got or er, er, made rank a little bit faster. I went then to a spec four, and then made E five. I'd probably been over there about six months, I guess. And one of the things they used to tell us in, in basic training, when we were down at Fort Polk especially, it was during winter and they heated all the rooms with coal stoves. It'd just be hotter and sin and you're trying to stay awake and somebody would fall asleep and a drill sergeant start screaming at you, you, know, you better pay attention because if your squad leader gets dusted off, 
you're going to need to know this. You might become an ex-squalier, and that's exactly what happened to me. So, so that um, that's kind of that happened when we were walking patrol and everything. Well, probably after about six, seven months after I was over there, we just got to the point we weren't making any contact there. You just weren't seeing any movement during the day, so they assumed every everybody was moving at night. So they started running ambush squads. And we started, since it was toward the end of the Vietnam War, they started sending units home. And if you didn't have 10 months in country with your unit, they would redeploy you to a different unit. So we started getting guys assigned to our platoon. And fourth platoon is always your mortar platoon. Well, these guys weren't trained on the mortar. They were just regular infantrymen. So we formed an ambush squad and they made me squad leader of that. So we'd go out for three days at a time. You'd hide during the day and right after dark you'd move out and, and find a site to, so you'd have a human ambush and then we'd also go out and set up mechanical ambushes using claymore mines and trip wires. And if you, an area of operation might be say the size of like Delaware County or Madison County and if you've got all the, you know, you've got the Americal Division, you've got all your different um, companies you know, brigade all broken out into squad size, and if each squad is setting out a couple of mechanical ambushes, the theory was that you've got the whole county surrounded. If anybody's moving, they're going to make contact with somebody. So, so I started doing that for quite a while, and you know, saw a little bit of action. But in in all fairness, you know, I make no bones about the area that I was in. It was just very heavily booby trapped. It was it was more of a psychological warfare. There there were times you just wish you would have could have actually seen somebody to shoot at, you know, because when, you know, somebody, you know, steps on a, on a booby trap, you know, you can't fight back at that, you know, so, so that's kind of what we, yeah, very angry, you know, so. What was your relationship like with the people that were there? Did you listen, did you get time to listen to him, and do you remember me talking about, and, and I'm almost embarrassed to bring, but slant, I, but you remember me telling you how frustrating it was to be and I'm a very friendly person. I mean, I just I like to try and get along, try to get to know where I'm at and everything. But it was just kind of frustrating because they, if they spoke in, if they understood you, they certainly did acknowledge it. And you just imagine being someplace for close to a year and never really being able to communicate with the people that you're supposed to be protecting. Uh, you almost had a sense like they didn't even want you there. And needless to say, I didn't really want to be there, you know. So it was just kind of, it was a frustrating experience, really. I it just, you know, I, and the main thing, I, I don't think any of us really could tell you why we were there, you know. That's, I've, I've reflected on that a lot as I've gotten older. And I often thought, you know, if they'd have given us maybe an hour or two of classes just on, on the culture, you know, just to, kind of prepare you a little bit, but but at that at our level, ours wasn't to question, it was just to do what we were told, you know, so. Once you were promoted, do you, do you see the lives of your men differently, your lives? Yeah, it, that's, uh, that's kind of a difficult situation when, and, and I, I can honestly say I don't, I, I never felt like anybody uh, had any animosity toward me because I, I made some rank, but uh, you know, it's just like even in an office environment, if you get promoted up to uh, you know some kind of an appointment of uh, authority, you know, supervisor, and all of a sudden you're supervising your comrades, that that's that can be a difficult task. And I I always chose just to to lead by example. I I, I think my men knew I, I would never ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself, and and I would do it with them. So. Uh, and that's just, that's how you got along over there, so. Uh, can you describe the people that you were really close with? Yeah, okay. Billy Roden, he was from uh, from Arkansas, and um, he was, uh, he was just an old southern boy, loved a deer hunt, loved Jack Daniels, and uh, and he loved Archie Manning. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure Archie graduated from the University of Arkansas, and that's Peyton and Eli Manning's dad, and uh, we got our fill of <laughs> Billy Road. He get a get a snoop full of Jack Dan. We start hearing Archie Manning stories and everything. But uh, another thing I need to explain, you know, growing up in County, Indiana, 
I was I wasn't exposed to a lot of uh, other na nationalities. In all fairness, I never really around the black community that maybe a little bit in athletics. And that's one thing about the military. You're thrown in. It's a melting pot. And uh, I knew nothing about the Jewish religion. I had one guy named Dwork, and one day he was. We got to be pretty good friends. He looked at me. He goes, Foster, how how did a kid like you from from Cowan, Indiana? get such a good Jewish nose and you didn't even know what uh, what the Jewish religion, you know. And I remember one guy calling, uh, he called this guy Ski and finally I asked, why did you call him Ski? And he said, well, he's Polish. Everybody's Polish, their in name ends with, with Ski and that was just a nickname for people. And I was totally oblivious. I had no idea about that. Uh, met a couple good friends from uh, New York City, Michael Barbara, uh, Ricky Riccardi, uh, or Bacardi, right? and you know, it was just, Again, coming from Cowan, Indiana, and, and you know, and these guys had the you know the New York accents, and it was just you just became good friends with them, you know. So now, do you think there were racial tensions? Not really. The only time that we really experienced that, we had a had a black NCO. He was regular army that was sent out. This guy was just he was just bad news. There there was no doubt about it that he he would play people against each other, tried to play the race card, and word soon got back to the rear that you better get this guy out of here because if you want him to walk out of here, I mean, he, he was just, he was bad news, and they they soon moved him out, you know, and I ha have no idea what, what his agenda was, you know, but, uh, you know, when you're out in the field, everybody got along great because you had to depend on each other, but when you'd get back for stand down, the Soul Brothers would all congregate, and uh, the Southern boys, they'd, they'd sit around, the druggies would have their areas, and so everybody, you know, everybody just kind of got along, you know. So. Uh, what was R&R &R like? That was, uh, that was, for me, uh, yeah, I first went to Sydney, Australia, that was just quite an experience. I mean, again, I just felt like I, w I was kind of living a, a, a fantasy a little bit, you know. And you know, that, the military afforded me to, I was able to see a lot of the world I, I would have never seen. And uh, it was a great experience going there. Uh, I don't remember a whole lot about it. It was just the fact that it, I wasn't in Vietnam, you know. And you could converse in English with people, have good conversations. And uh, it was a great experience. But. But after that, I came back. I was out in the field for maybe a month and a half, and then I went on a, it was like a seven-day leave, and I went to Hong Kong, and I totally fell in love with Hong Kong. That was just, you know, it was still a British rule at that time, and uh, it was list, literally paradise. It, it was a, a great time, so. Um, I was gonna get into the social and cultural aspects of, of being there. Um, you already talked about um, racial tensions. So, mm -hmm. how about uh, instances of fragging? I'll tell you, in all fairness, the only time I was aware of that was back at Firebase Dotty. You know, you had permanent party, the, the artillery, you know, already they had their permanent bunkers. And they got fed up with one of their company commanders and fragged it, killed him. Uh, that was about the only instance I was ever aware of. Really, it, we were so tight in my units. That, I mean, that was just never an issue at, at all. So, so how did it make you feel that other people would do that? I, mean, I hate to say it, but you, and and I, I don't feel this way now. But at the time, I think you just kind of felt, well, he must have deserved it if if they did it. You know, I know that's 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 poor, but uh, I don't. You just felt like there had to been a reason for that somebody to be that that upset with somebody. How did you feel about those who were conscientious, conscientious objectors? Okay, um, you know, we had two of our, uh, you know, an RTO, a radio operator. See, being fourth platoon, you were assigned with your company commander and the RTO unit. They were the one, they had several radio operators that they were in contact with all the, the squads, platoons and everything. And two of the RTO that carried the radios for the company commander were conscientious object, didn't carry rifles. And nice, I mean, they were, they were 
they were dopers, you know, they liked their marijuana, liked the heavy music and everything. Decent guys and everything. And uh, and I'll tell you, the irony of that is, you know, your radio, that's that's a weapon of war. I mean, you, you call in artillery and everything. And I'm of the opinion, you know, if you're going to be humping and risking your butt out there, you better have, have, have a rifle, you know. So a, a good friend of mine, he was a year ahead of me in high school. I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, he... Uh, was able to get CO status, but he worked at a, a VA hospital, I think it was down in Evansville for two years. And I swear to you, I had no problem with that. I had no problem with the guys that went to Canada because my my feelings all along was, if you can sleep at night, that's that's all that matters. You know, I I chose not to, but I, I swear to you, I had, had no animosity toward anybody else. You, everybody's got to fight their own battles, you know, so. My parents didn't feel that way, so. In fact, my, after I got out of the service, I had I needed to get a car, so went to a used car. And my friend, Mike Jones, that had been a CO that was in Evansville, his dad worked at this used car lot. And we're sitting here talking, and I'm very fortunate because I think it went right over my dad's head, but this Mike's father was saying to me, said, uh, yeah, you know, Mike got his CEO status, and uh, he served in a hospital down in Evansville. I, I don't think my dad, key, key, you know, keyed in on that. I think if he had, he would have been very upset about it. And I was very glad that he he didn't understand what he was saying. So, because it that just wasn't the way I felt about it, you know. So, well, you and your family communicated through your dad, right? Mm-hmm. It would, by the time I was over there, it was pretty common. Wrote more letters than anything, but it, it was just nice to be able to send a tape, and uh, it was it was neat being able to hear voices and everything. They had uh, I forget what I think it was called the Mars Network, and where you could actually make a phone call. I never did it because you kind of reserve that for the married men, you know, if they want to talk to their wives, and you had to use the military procedure. Uh, Hello, honey over or something like that. It was kind of, one night you could hear these guys making the calls, you know, and it, it seemed kind of, are you really communicating, you know, when you have to use all that. But but uh, it was just really neat getting a tape from home and listening to it. So. And how did your uh, friends over there, how did they like that? I, you know, I don't know that they ever sit down and listen to your tapes with you, but we get, we call them care packages. and. You shared that with everybody, and that was just that was neat, you know, just sharing it with all your friends, and you're always the recipient of someone else's care package. But that was just uh, that was kind of neat when the mailbag would be dropped off, and it'd be a package, and you know, as so you'd tear into it and be divvying things up. So I've got a, a a funny story. We used to have two newspapers in Muncie. There was the Star, the Evening Press, and then there was the Morning Paper. And during that, the Vietnam War, if if you uh, if someone entered your name and your uh, your APO address, they would send you the Star Press, and we would get resupplied every three days, and they'd drop off a red nylon bag, and it'd have your mail in it. And it seemed like maybe every two or three weeks, all of a sudden, the bag would seem a lot bigger and open, and it, there might be like ten newspapers rolled up from. The Star Press, so, and there's no, you don't have, you know, we're just there for maybe two or three hours and we're getting ready to hump out, so you'd be digging through trying to get, and you'd ha pass them out to some of your buddies and everything, and I finally ran into uh, the pad man back in the rear that he was in charge of getting the, the mail bags on the right birds and everything, and he finally, so you're Sergeant Paul, you're the guy that keeps getting all those newspapers, you know, but but that was kind of neat seeing. But the neat thing, too, you'd read articles in there. It was telling, you know, breaking news. And hell, that, that might have been something that happened two months ago, you know, around where you're at. So sometimes people at home, they didn't get a, and, and that it was one thing in tapes, too, I would quickly point out to my mom and dad, you know, hey, that article that was there, that, that happened a long time ago, so that's not going on right now. So you did all you could to try and, you know, diffuse any fear, fears they might have and everything, so. Um, did you write differently when you wrote letters? Did you write differently to different people? Yeah. It, after a while, it, your letters got became kind of brief, and especially if you were doing a voice tape and everything. But it was sometimes more of an obligation because I, I knew that 
well, you, you imagine if, I don't know if you're a parent, but if if all of a sudden, you know, if your child's away from you and they're during a war and all of a sudden two or three weeks go by and you don't get a letter. So even if it's just a few words, you know, you always tried to send something out. Uh, you repeated some of your story, you know, depending on what had happened, you found yourself repeating that, you know, with different people. But, but I had a, actually, we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend, but a girl I graduated from high school with, she wrote me the entire time I was over there. And I, I think I shared some, a few different things with her than, than probably what I did my parents. So. Your family would record music for you on these tapes. Mm -hmm. How important was music for you? Uh, that was really, I, I don't know if you ever saw Good Morning Vietnam, but, and I've got to be honest, I, we weren't, we didn't really have access to uh, Armed Forces Network, right? it, it, only if we were back in the rear. So I wasn't really familiar with that phenomena, but, uh, you know, when a, a good friend of mine sent me some, ta and he did, I don't know if you're in, in the tape, I was talking, it was called the Tony Pig Show. and. Uh, and that was some pretty heavy music for, for WLBC, but uh, he just made up a tape that had a variety of artists and there was some stuff from Woodstock and whatever. And that, even, you remember me telling you about the, the guys that were uh, the CEOs, that, the druggies that were the radio, they loved that. They, they always wanted to borrow my tape and everything. So it was, you were really, music really meant a lot to you over there, so. Can you tell me some of your favorites? Oh, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, a lot of people, Joe Cocker, a lot of people from from uh, Woodstock. That was that was pretty trendy at that time. With the uh, the Blacks, they were really into Michael Jackson, The Temptations. Uh, I know uh, Billy Road and guys like the, the Southern Boys. They like Johnny Cash and a lot of country music. So there was when you be back at the fire bay, depending on where you were at, you could. You hear all kinds of music and everything, you know. So. Well, I know with Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, you know, they were very anti-war. Anti mm -hmm. Now, how did that, you know? Really, uh, it, it wasn't an issue. I mean, nobody, nobody cared what music you <laughs> listened to. You know, as long as you got your job done, there, out in the field, there, nobody cared really. Oddly enough, when I got out of this, uh, back from Vietnam, I was sent to Fort Hood, Texas. And uh, about that time, Donald Sutherland, I think Jane Fonda, Country Joe McDonald, um, I forget who uh, some of the other stars, but they were doing, it was the FTA shows, and uh, they held one right outside of Fort Hood, Texas. And I didn't go to it, but a, a, a friend of mine went to it, and it was rumored that you know, the military, they were shooting photos of any, any GIs that were in, you know, attending that. Whether they did, I, I don't know. So it was no big deal. <laughs> yeah. So when did you come down with malaria? Okay, that was after I got back. Uh, I came home from, uh, from Vietnam, flew into Fort Lewis, Washington. Got in there probably about six or seven in the evening. Uh, they treated us to a steak dinner, went through... Uh, got my finance records update, got my back pay, and quickly, it was set through some kind of an orientation, and I know they gave us like six weekly malaria pills, and I'm certain they told us, you need to take these while you're home. <laughs> I get back home on the block, you know, I maybe took one or two, and I hate to be gross, but they gave you diarrhea, you, you hated to take them, and after a couple of weeks, I just kind of forgot to take them, and it, it was stupid. I mean, it never occurred to me w that I could come down with malaria once I got back to the state side. And so I got sent to Fort Hood and I was down there probably about four weeks and I got sicker than a, a sick as I've ever been in my life. And they sent me over, I went over to uh, the dispensary and they sent me over to the hospital for some blood work. And these guys, they just assumed that I had, um, oh, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. What's the druggies get? Um, what, what's the blood disorder? I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm drawing drawing a blank. But anyhow, they they assume, you know they were asking me did did you use drugs? And I smoked a little marijuana when I first got over there. But you know I wasn't using any hardcore drugs. And um, they suspected. I, I wish I could think of what. I, th I think there's type A, type B, hepatitis. hepatitis. And they just 
they assume, and, and I remember one of them laughing and said, this might be the first uh, legitimate case of hepatitis. They just knew I had it. Well, finally they called, I was over at the motor pool, I'm just sicker than a dog, and they, Sergeant Foster, you need to report to the dispenser. I get over there, and they said, you need to get to the hospital, you've got malaria. <laughs> so, and I, I felt, I do, <laughs> you know, because at least I knew what was wrong with me. And so I was in the hospital for about a week, and uh, I just remember the first night I was there, I was just, I was just totally delirious with it, fever, and they gave me, gave me some antibiotics or something, and I just crashed in my bed, and I, I'll never forget, I remember wake, I'm just chilled to the bone, and somebody's shaking me, and all they know me is Foster, because that's, that's what was on my bed, and she's going, Foster, you don't have to sleep in those wet clothes, and my fever had broken, and this was no exaggeration, I mean, my clothes were soaked, my sheets were soaked, and I, I'm standing, they're stripping me down, I'm shivering, and they had to put dry, th you know, sheets and blankets on my bed, and after that first 24 hours, I started feeling better, but this was an infectious ward, and they had armed guards, you know, at the door, because a lot of these guys in there were, had hepatitis, they were druggies, you know, so, and some of my close friends, they didn't even know what had happened to, <laughs> to me, and finally they were able to come over and visit me, and uh, <laughs> so, even, I mean, back in my company, they didn't really know what had happened, you know, it wasn't like I could leave a message or something, you know, so. I was there a full year. They started, again, since the war was winding down, they started, you had what's called your, your date of estimated rotate, your DROS date, and uh, probably after, I was over about seven or eight months, they started, they would take a DROS date and they'd start maybe giving a 15 day drop and 30, and it, at one point it got up to, I think, almost three month drops that some people were getting. They were only over there nine months. And it, it worked so well that they they were able to thin the, the numbers down. So then they started backing off. And the closer it got my dear, I, I got no no break. So I spent a full year over there. So. Uh, was it hard to leave? No, not at all. <laughs> you know, a little bittersweet about, you know, leaving some of your buddy. But again, remember, we your close friends, they were right on line with you. So they were getting ready to leave too, so. Much of the same way that you went to Vietnam. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think we must have flown. I don't I don't know that we flew to Japan. That that part I don't remember. I think we did probably refuel in Anchorage. But I just remember landing at Seattle Tacoma Airport. And if you've ever been to the Northwest, the 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 trees. I I have never smelled sweeter smelling air in my life. And one thing Vietnam just it just had an odor about it. It was just a I don't know if you've ever heard people talk about gooks or they were just, you know, it, if you shave, you know, if you're shaving, if you cut yourself, the fix all treatment was your medic always kept peroxide and you'd dab with peroxide and just keep it clean because if you didn't, within 24 hours, you'd get what they called a gook or it would get infected because there was just so much bacteria airborne and everything. And, you know, the, uh, the you know, it, and your company rear the bases there. They were outdoor latrines. They'd burn it off, pull the cans out, and pour uh, fuel oil in it, and burn it off that way. And the local people in the villages, they they just went out and used their their rice paddy. So the kind, it just kind of had a stench to it. And I'll tell you, it was so sweet getting out of that plane in in Seattle. It just it was just like it was. Yeah, I can remember it. You know, so. Uh, how well were you received once you got here? by my family very well. In fact, I've got some uh, some video that my brother-in-law shot. And I mean, I, when I first watched that after years, I mean, I, it brought tears to my eyes because my mom and dad and my sister, they were, their face was about ready to break. They were smiling. So, and I get, get a little, I get a little emotional emotional talking about that, but seeing that, I had no idea you know, what my parents went through while I was over there. It was just to see the smiles on their faces, you know, their son had come home. There was even a couple of people that just total strangers sitting there, and they were smiling. They didn't even know me, you know, so... It was, it 
it was just it was one of the happiest times of my life and uh it was just tough knowing what your parents went through, you know. So, did you ever experience some of the negative things that other people have? You know, I don't recall anybody ever personally directing anything to me, but I'll tell you, I get, as I got older, I, get, it, I got very, I don't know if it was angry, but just... Just the fact you you've heard my my story, and I'm from Cowan, Indiana, and this is one of the most proud things I've ever I'm, I've done in my life. And I couldn't even sit in a bar and have a beer and tell somebody what I've been doing for the last year. And I you know I didn't under, I don't understand what that was about, you know, because all, all any of us did we just did what our country told us to do, and and then you, it was just like this big sit you couldn't even talk about it and. And, you know, it, it's upsetting that to me that, you know, the, uh, I think it's, it's, it's long enough past, but, you know, for the last 15 years, you know, you mentioned a Vietnam veteran. That, I don't think that was a very positive image to a lot of people. And that, you know, I don't, it's just, it's just kind of upsetting, you know, because I'll tell you, it's the proud, it's, it's probably the proudest thing I've ever done in my life, you know, and. I, I just don't, I don't understand. I, I remember when after Desert Storm and, you know, that was an air, that, that war was won, fought and won in the air o overnight just about. And we deployed ground troops. And I'm, I thank God that they, none of these guys were injured. I don't know that we even lost any people, any ground troops due to combat. But I'll never forget, you know, they, they brought these people back and they had ticker tape parades in New York City. And that, and I think they realized that that just kind of, that kind of opened some old wounds to Vietnam veterans because, you know, you just kind of snuck back into the country and tried to get involved in your life and, and get on with things, you know, so. And maybe that was good too, you know, may, you know, that's, I just went on with my life and kind of put it behind me and everything, so. So you didn't have any trouble readjusting? I did, the first year, and another thing, I. I had to report back to work over at, uh, went to work at Delco Remy and, you know, that had been about, actually, I got a three month early out, so I was only in the service for about 21 months, but, you know, it's been about 21 months just around men, you know, and all of a sudden I'm thrown back into a work schedule, you know, at, uh, over at Anderson and uh, we were working a lot of overtime and, I was in a plant where you didn't even have windows, so during the winter, I mean, you'd work for two or three and never even see daylight because we were going in early, working late, seven days a week, and I was living alone at the time. And I remember, you know, I'd get home, fix something to eat, turn on the TV, fall asleep on the couch, wake up about 10, drag myself in, go to bed, get up the next morning. And one night I go to get out and I just, I sit down on the edge of bed and I just started crying. <laughs> and, and I knew that wasn't right, you know. And it was just amazing. I just went to my family doctor, and he started asking me a few questions. He said, it, you know, John, you're just going through some depression. I think he put me on some mild antidepressant for a short while. He said, it's not going to change your life. But uh, he said, you need to start making some decisions, you know, and just try be aware that that's, that's the problem. And, and I, I was f quickly recovered, you know. But um, it was a little hard, you know, that first year adjusting. Uh, it was probably a good year that I could walk without looking down at the ground because that's just the way you operated over because you're worried about trip, you know, trip lines and things like that. So, uh, so it, it took a while to, to adjust, but, um, uh, I remember it's not been, it's been in the last 10 years. I read an article there. I think he was a retired Colonel. Are we okay? The voice level. Okay. What was your last last question? I don't know. I was actually doing good. Um, well, you were talking about your Delco Remy and, and the, the moment you had. Okay. Yeah, after, um, well, I know what I was going to tell you. I'd read this story about, I think this was after so many years where things could, went into public record. And I don't know if you ever saw the... Uh, I think it was Life or Look magazine when they had the Vietnam, the wall, when they first opened that. And they showed this 
this veteran, you know, and he's he's leaning up against the wall. And he's got his hand over a name, and he's got the long hair and the beard and the field jacket, and tears are streaming out of his eyes. And he even had his name. Well, this colonel, he became curious since these records were public. He just started researching a lot of this, and I'm pretty certain the article I read. This particular guy that made the cover, look, he discovered this guy had never even been in the army, little and. So he started checking on, like, do you know Brian Dennehy, the actor? Okay, he was on uh, Johnny Carson one night, when he kind of walked with a limp, and they asked, and he said, uh, yeah, it was a war wound I got when I was in, I was in the Marines in Vietnam. Well, he checked him out. He spent all of his time in Okinawa, and this guy came to the conclusion that I'm a little more the, the normal Vietnam veteran, that the vast majority of them just came home, they put that behind them, they went, got on with their lives and, and never really looked back, you know. And, and that's, that kind of saddens me too. Like, like I said earlier, you know, I just, I just, uh, I think the image that people have of the Vietnam veteran, you know, like Tom Cruise, born the 4th of July, you know, that's, I don't think that that's really, the, I think the vast majority of us just got on with our lives, you know, so. Did your friends have any trouble adjusting once they got here? You, my friend, after I got back, you mean, um, that was kind of an interesting thing because it seemed like my friends kind of, there was a, a big Jesus movement that went on about that time. Uh, some of my friends were kind of into the, the drug scene and others were into the Jesus movement. And I probably gravitated more to the Jesus friends for a while, but, and then the fact I started working over at Anderson, I just kind of made new friends. but. It's gone full circle. We've all come back and uh, very close friends now. Some of the guys I went to high school, I mean, we're very good friends now. And uh, it's almost like, it, we just, it's just like, hey, whatever we did, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, we were all just kind of finding ourselves, I guess, so. Now you're active with the website for the First Division. Actually, See, that that was probably put together, oh, three, four, five years ago, and a, this Lieutenant Johnson is the one that set it up, and I can't even, I don't know if I just did a Google and came upon this, and so I submitted a lot of things for it, but it has since, I think AOL has since taken it down, and uh, I had a hard time finding it again, so I think that that's kind of run its course, I think. Uh, Oddly enough, though, in this last year, I got a, an email a couple of times from a guy, Michael Baker. He was the only guy I, I was in Vietnam with. It was from Indiana. And just out of the clear blue sky, I got a couple of emails. And I asked him, how did you find And I think he got my email off of, probably off of that site, I guess. So. Do you think it's good to have reunions or get-togethers? You know, I attempt, I got in touch you know, in the last five years with some guys. And we kind of talked about it, but... You know, the the bottom line is the only thing we had in common was Vietnam, and, and we've just, I think we all came to the realization it'd just be like a bunch of strangers getting together now, and the only thing we had, con how long are you going to talk about that, and then, well, nice weather, <laughs> you know, what, what do you do after that, you know, so. And, I mean, it, some of the closest friendships, strongest friendships you would ever have. And, and I, I remember very well, you know, when we parted, you know, thinking, you know, we'll never forget each other. And you don't forget them, but it's, we're just, it was a different time, different place, so. How do you feel about Vietnam now? Well, there is a, a documentary, I think it's called The Fog of War. It's a Robert McNamara, won an actually Academy Award here about two or three years ago. And I watched that and, you know, he he just died here in the last year. And in later years, he he was kind of the architect for Vietnam. You know, he, he uh, John Kennedy, he was actually a Ford executive. John Kennedy got him to, I think he was Secretary of State or what. And, and then when Kennedy was assassinated, he stayed on with Johnson. And he was the one advising Johnson, you know, if, if you'll send you know, 20,000 more troops or 50,000, we can win this. And later in life, he, he, I think he took the, the full brunt of the, the guilt of, of every life that was lost, every 
soldier was maimed or what have you, he came to the conclusion he was totally wrong. We were totally wrong about Vietnam. And he said something in that. He was invited to some kind of a state dinner in Vietnam, well, it was in Ho Chi Minh City. And he was seated with like his contemporary, you know, that, of that time. And he, from what I remember of the document, he, he kind of, he kind of laughed. He said, this guy was still pissed at me. He said, where did you in America, where did you guys come up with this domino theory that, you know, we wanted to take over South Vietnam and then Cambodia, Laos. And he said, it was never, it was always a civil war. For, we just wanted to unite the North with the South. That's end of sentence. We had no aspirations to go beyond our borders. And, you know, based on that, you asked me what my thoughts about Vietnam. I still, I have no, why, why did we go over there then? Why did we not realize that? And, and how did, what amazes me is how that, how we stayed in Vietnam as long as we did, how the American public stood for it. And I know those are some of the ugliest times in American history, the protesting and everything, but I'm surprised anybody got reelected that supported the war. I mean, that, that's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? If you just don't vote for, if you support, you don't know, elect candidates that want us out of there, and then we get out of it. But I know it wasn't that easy. I remember, you know, trying to come out with a, you know, peace with dignity, you know, withdrawal with dignity, and it just wasn't going to happen, you know. And again, I I relate back to it would have been nice having gone over if I just kind of knew why we were going over there. But maybe that was part of it. maybe they. Maybe we weren't, they, they couldn't afford to let us know why we were over there. We might not have gone, I guess. So, Do so you see similarities I, in that, today's war? Yes, it's got me thinking a lot. I, I don't know when my heart's been any sadder than 9 11. And I think the whole world felt like we were justified in pursuing who who perpetrated this. And I, that said, I think we were justified in going into Afghanistan. But it has occurred to me, and, it, and by you contacting me, and it just got me thinking about things. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm asking some questions about Afghanistan right now. Do most people even know why we're still there? And a bigger question is how do, how do we know when the job's done over there? And I don't think we do. And I, the same way with Vietnam, how, how do we know when that was done? And, you know, in, in Vietnam, I don't know if this was brought out in that documentary, but one of the things they, a realization is that North Vietnam was, more children were being born every year in North Vietnam than we were killing of their soldiers. And they were in it for the long run. And they, they basically told us, we will, if, if you want to continue, we will wait you out. We will overpopulate that more than you can kill us. And eventually your soldiers will get their fill of it. Your people will get your, their fill of it. And and they'll want out. And I think the same thing, the potential, you know, lies the same way in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know. So, so I, I do draw a lot of comparisons. Well, you said before being drafted, what were your plans? I guess at some point to go on to college, but um, I, I hate to say it, I the mindset was probably work in the factory for a while and then and then probably go on to college, I guess. So. Did you stick to these plans? Or? I went to college after I got out of the service, but uh, <laughs> you know, you have no idea what I do for a living, do you? You said you were a hairdresser. Oh, okay, did I tell you? Okay. Yeah. And that's, uh, I don't I don't know how why I decided to do that, but when I was in high school, I worked in retail in a retail store, and I just really enjoyed working for the public. And that, I just knew I wanted to do something like that. So I, I hated working in the factory. So, and I just enjoyed being self-employed, so. Would you say that any of the experiences that you took out of Vietnam have helped you in your career? Um, other than just self-confidence and everything, but I, I can't really say that anything in the military has helped me in my career. I, I really don't think so. Well, I want to end it on a proud note. Okay. So if, if you want to get some of your medals out, um, what kind of rewards did you receive? Okay, I um, probably what, like most people in the infantry, uh, 
The one I'm most proud of is my, this is called the CIB, your combat infantry badge. And you got that after you had to have so many months in a, in a combat zone. This was my Vietnam service. I was awarded a Bronze Star, and I've got to be honest, I'm not real sure why. <laughs> I wish I could say I led some charge, but uh, I'm, I'm very proud of it. But uh, I don't feel like I did anything anyone else didn't do. So, And the rest of these, this is just the campaign ribbons and everything. But, but this is the one I'm most proud of, and these were the guys I served with. So I was thrilled. My wife gave this to me as a Christmas gift, and uh, I just really cherish it so well thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for your service well thank you i i, appreciate it. I, I it, it's, it was an honor to be be a part of this it really was so